Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. So, finding theory takes a little bit to wrap your mind around being bound, being free, the fact that binding is a complicated relationship of C command and co-indexing, the notion of binding domain, and the three different kinds of nouns that are governed by principles A, B, and C. But you might ask yourself, why does all this matter? Why do linguists care about, about binding theory? Well, there's a number of reasons for this. First of all, remember, we're starting with our hypothesis that sentences are structured entities. And those structures, those constituent structures, have a particular hierarchical form. Using the mathematical tools of structural relations, like C command, we can see that different elements within the tree are in different positions. So one thing that we can take away from binding theory is that things like binding theory make reference to this hierarchical structure and to the structural relationships that hold over it. Binding theory shows us that um, some noun phrases are more prominent than others. In particular, those noun phrases are in C command relationships with other noun phrases. It also shows us um, that we have a tool that we can use for probing that hierarchical structure. So you can use binding theory as a special diagnostic tool to show if something is higher up in the tree or lower down in the tree by whether or not things can be bound or not. So let me give you an example to put some, um, some actual teeth into that question. Let's think about VSO languages. VSO languages are verb subject to object languages. Scottish Gaelic, the sentence here is gich ion antaran, is uh, in the order verb subject object. So although the words appear in the order um, uh, ate Ian the bread, it means Ian ate the bread. Now, there are two hypotheses about how these sentences are structured. One is that um, the two noun phrases are what we call flat. So the two noun phrases are on the same level as the verb. The reason that people have proposed this is because it's essentially impossible to create a verb phrase that consists of the verb plus the object, but excludes the subject when the subject is in the middle of the two. Remember, you can't cross lines. So some people have proposed that the two noun phrases exist as sisters to that verb in these languages, and they just have a very different constituent structure. We're going to call this the flat structure hypothesis because the two noun phrases are on the same level. They're flat with the verb. There's another hypothesis called the hierarchical hypothesis where in fact the two noun phrases are on different levels, just like they're on different levels in English and French and languages with an SVO order. So in English, we have the subject is higher in the tree, it's in the subject position, and we have objects which are lower in the tree, it's in the object position. And the idea behind the hierarchical hypothesis is that that relationship where subjects are higher in the tree than objects holds even in these languages that are VSO. Now, you'll notice my tree is quite abstract here because I'm trying to get away uh, from talking about those empty spaces that you see in that tree, those empty labels. Um, we will come back to this when we do the unit on head movement. But for the moment, let's just assume that the verb is relatively high in the tree, then there's the subject noun phrase, and the object is much lower. The critical difference between the flat structure hypothesis and the hierarchical hypothesis is that in the hierarchical hypothesis, 
one noun phrase C commands the other. So let's think about this very carefully and how binding theory can help us distinguish between these two hypotheses. In the flat structure hypothesis, the two noun phrases are in a symmetric C command relationship. So in principle, with the, if the flat structure hypothesis is correct, either noun phrase could be an anaphor, and either noun phrase could be a bound pronoun, because they are in the same symmetric relationship with one another. Um, I'm sorry, neither NP can be uh, a bound pronoun, because they're, they would be in the same clause, and they would C command one another. But this is not true in the hierarchical hypothesis, right? In the hierarchical hypothesis, the subject NP C commands the second NP. So you should not be able to put an anaphor in the first position because it would never be bound. Let's just look at these trees again. So in the tree on the left, you should be able to put an anaphor in the first position because it could be bound by the noun phrase in the second position. In the tree on the right, you could only have an anaphor in the second position, the object position. So binding theory gives us a probe to distinguish between these two hypotheses. Let's see what's right. So it turns out that the binding facts of Scottish Gaelic demonstrate that the hierarchical hypothesis has to be correct. So Hunnic in a hain is correct. That's a perfectly grammatical sentence. Ehain is an anaphor, and it can appear in the second position. But hunic ehain eon um, is ungrammatical, with one little caveat that I will come up tell you about in a moment. But it is ungrammatical with that bound interpretation, where um, ehain means he self. It's a self form. Um, that's ungrammatical. And it would be predicted to be grammatical on, under the flat structure hypothesis. And it's predicted to be ungrammatical in the hierarchical hypothesis because the first noun phrase, C commands the second one. Now, I will tell you that there's a, a meaning for the ungrammatical sentence here. Uh, it's a meaning which is not an anaphoric meaning of the word he self. In, uh, in Gallic and other Celtic languages, you can use the same self-morpheme as a special kind of emphasis or topic marker. So hunic ehain eon is actually a grammatical sentence, but not with uh, an anaphoric reading. What it means is, oh, look, that guy, he saw eon. And they're not bound at all, okay? So the, if, you, if you speak any Scottish Gaelic, you'll know that you actually can say sentences like the second one. But what's critical is it cannot have that anaphoric reading. In any case, what we're able to do with binding theory is use binding theory as a probe. We can see if two noun phrase are, phrases are on the same level or if they're on different levels. And in this particular case, we see that the binding facts show that the two noun phrases are on different levels. And that's a very interesting result because it tells us something about an otherwise um, confusing set of data. So linguists care about binding theory because it reveals things about the hierarchical structure of the sentences we're looking at. To summarize this whole unit on binding theory, we talked about some basic terms. Antecedent, which means the element that gives its meaning to an anaphor or a pronoun. Anaphors, those are noun phrases that require an antecedent within their clause. They're the two-year-olds. Um, indices, or index, which is the, our mechanism for marking the meaning of the noun phrases. We talked about pronouns, which are noun phrases that can refer back to an element uh, elsewhere in the sentence. They're like teenagers. They want their antecedent to be far away or not existent at all. And are expressions, which get their reference from the world, 
or the imaginary world. Um, we couch this in terms of a special version of C command called binding. So binding is an asymmetric relationship. Things don't bind each other. A binds B if and only if A C commands B and they're co-indexed. So binding is C command with co-indexation. We talked about the idea of being free. Free means you're not in a binding relationship. And then finally, we talked about the binding domain. The binding domain is the clause that contains the anaphore or the pronoun. Anaphores like to be bound within their domain. Pronouns want to be free within their domain. And this gives us our three principles. Binding principle A, an anaphore must be bound in its binding domain. Principle B, pronouns must be free in their binding domain. And principle C, our expressions must always be free.